Hey folks, Colin here from Something's Recording, and today I'm going to show you the top five things I do on every mix. Essentially, we're talking about workflow today, but before we dive in, if you're ready to go a little bit deeper into the mixing process and start to hone your workflow as an engineer, then I have just the tool for you. It is my seven-step mixing checklist. It's a simple PDF that will guide you through the entire mixing process, step by step to help you get professional and radio ready mixes without the hassle and without the guesswork. It is completely free and you can download it below using the link in the video description. Now let's jump in here and talk about the top five things I do on every mix. The first thing I do on every mix is to put in my mix bus processing. My mix bus processing is in, is in excuse me, right from the get go. So that's my console shaper, my SSL style bus compressor, and the tape machine. Those are in from the get-go before I even get balances, before I even pull anything up, before any EQ goes on. Three, these three plugins are in and ready to go. Let me play you what the mix is sounding like, and I'm gonna A, B the mix bus processing, and we'll go through each plugin here quickly. Three plugins here that are always going in right from the get-go. This is my number one thing I do on every mix. It's always there. I have the console shaper in, so this is giving me a little bit of that console vibe. Helps me get my balances a little bit quicker, get my feet underneath me. I have my SSL style bus compressor in here. This helps me get my levels where I need them to because I never change these settings. So I mix into this and I know if this is working at about one to maybe three dB of compression, I'm at a good place mix wise and I will be at a good place mastering wise. Tape machine, third plugin always in right from the get go. All I have is this is pushed up just a touch from the default settings and I use it on the B setting and at 30 ips. It helps give me a little bit of that analog tape vibe to level out, or not level out, to get rid of that flatness or that dryness from a digital mix while also enhancing a little bit of my low end on this B setting. So that is the first thing I'm doing on my mix. Let me do another AB on these three plugins for you. We'll kind of put them in piece by piece here. So we'll start with out, we'll kick them in one by one. For me, that's a big advantage and a big benefit right from the get-go. That's why it's the number one thing I do on all of my mixes. The number two thing I do on all of my all of my mixes is I always get my 1176 going on the vocal. It helps get my vocal to a competitive point where I can pull it up in the mix and it's not going to get stepped on as everything builds in around it. Let me do an AB here on this compressor and we'll solo up the vocal as well. Running and running, I've been chasing her Without this plugin in, it's very easy for the vocal to get lost. It's very dynamic. It doesn't sit where you want it to inside the mix. So let's solo up the vocal here. I'll take off the reverb and you can hear it by itself. I'll do another AB on this compressor. All we're doing here is just an 1176. We have it at 0 .5556, 0 .56. Again, there's a glare there. I can't see 0 .56 milliseconds. Our release is all the way up at 50 milliseconds and then our 
input and output are set, so we're doing about seven to 10 dB of compression on our vocal. Really holding it in place. Running and running, I've been chasing her around, but I can't pin this little dragon down. She gives me half of a sign, she wants me in her life, but I can't help thinking that I'm wasting her time. I'll never be the man she needs, so I'll holds the vocal in place and keeps it up front and competitive in the rest of the mix. So nothing steps on our vocal, nothing oversteps our vocal. So we want our vocal to be competitive from the get-go as we pull it up. That's why it's one of the first things I put in on my vocal chain is that compressor. So that's one and two. Number three thing I always do is to separate my bass DI and my bass amp. So if we solo up our bass here, here's our DI. So I use my bass DI as the low end, so it's everything below 180, and then we'll pin that there. Here's our bass amp. Our bass amp is the opposite. It's everything above 180. I do this on probably 90% of the mixes I'm working on. If I have a bass DI and a bass amp, I always split the frequency range, so nothing's fighting for the low end. I don't want the bass amp and the bass DI to be fighting each other for control in the low end. I want one thing to be the low end signal, and I want one thing to be to the top end. It eliminates the phase issues. Even if they are in phase, there's always going to be some kind of issue with two signals having the same low end. That's why I separate them. We'll take a listen here, and I'll do an actually AB on these two plugins. You can hear what the bass sounds like if we don't separate the frequency range. You can hear without separating the frequency ranges, if they're both full range, we get a little bit of phase issues in the low end, things aren't quite as powerful as they could be, and we get a lot of mid-range honk, right? Because both of them are duplicating the mid-range at full aspect, both of them have the capabilities to do that, so we get a lot of mid-range honk, but we don't quite get the power in the low end. I use the DI for the low end because it's usually the cleanest signal, and some amps aren't duplicating the low end to its full extent. So I use the DI as the low end and I use the amp as the top end because it's usually gonna have a little bit more grit, a little bit more power to it. That's the third thing there. Fourth thing I always do is to put in my vocal reverb, my plate reverb here. So my plate reverb that I use on my vocals is usually just the stock reverb inside of Studio One. So it's just their room reverb and it's just a longer plate. So it's gonna be a two second plate with a 152 millisecond pre-delay. The reason I put this reverb in most of the time is because it always, always keeps separate from the vocal. If I put another reverb in without this, this pre-delay on it, it usually gets in the way of the vocal, muddies up the vocal. I can put this reverb in on any vocal and it will stay separate from the vocal while still giving it the tail it needs, still giving it the width it needs, and the length it needs. Let me solve the vocal here so you can hear this reverb uh, in effect. Running and running, I've been chasing her around, but I can't pin this little dragon down. She gives me half of a sign, she wants me in her life, but I can't help thinking that I'm wasting her time. I'll never be the man she needs, so I'll save my calls and be a memory, yeah, yeah. Running and running, I've been chasing her around, but I can't pin this little... You can hear the pre-delay leaves room for the vocal to shine and then the reverb to shine. We don't want the reverb right on top of the vocal, otherwise they're fighting each other and we're gonna have a little bit too much energy down in the low mids, then we end up having to cut more of our reverb to make sure it's not muddying up our sound. So we put that reverb in with the long pre-delay on it, and it helps to give the vocal the length and the width it needs without being too competitive from the reverb section, okay? So that's the fourth thing 
I usually put in. Last thing I do on every mix here is to put in my Bercasti reverb. So I don't have an actual Bercasti unit, but I have the impulse responses that I use for my drums. So let me play you the drums here, and we're gonna talk about this Bercasti emulation. So all of my drums are sending into this reverb bus here, or this effects bus here, which has the open air reverb on it, and we're using Rooms to Studio B, which is an impulse response from the Bercasti reverb. And this is on probably 90% of the drum mixes I'm doing, just to give them a little bit more room and a little bit more power to them. Pulling this up gives the drums so much more realism and so much more bigness to them. I probably couldn't live without it. I would use another reverb, but it wouldn't be as good as this reverb. This is another piece that's built into my template, like a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. So we don't need the congas, but we'll do an AB here with and without the Bercasti reverb. We'll start without, and then I'm gonna kick it in. Listen to how much bigger our drums get with this reverb in. The realness we get from pulling up this room emulation is impeccable to me. Without this, the drums sound dry and they sound smaller. When we kick this in, we get a little bit more bigness to our drum sound, a little bit more realism because we have that room effect and it helps them sit better inside the mix. The biggest difference for me on this is of course the snare because it's probably the biggest thing pushing into the Bercasti reverb. But let's put it in the mix here and I'll mute and unmute this reverb. Take a listen to how our drum sound changes inside the mix. You can hear how much easier it is to sit the drums inside the mix with this Bercasti reverb in, or with this close close mic in. So it's all it is is the so it's rooms to Studio B. So if you go into the Studio B settings in your Bercasti reverb, if you have the impulse responses, it's just room two Studio B, and I have it touched back a little bit too. I think it's pretty long when it comes in. I have it pulled all the way down to about 400 milliseconds and then I have it narrowed up as well. So it's not so wide and so unrealistic sounding for a smaller drum sound like this. So it's something you can pull in to give your drums a little bit more realism, but adjust to your drum sound as well so it fits with the tone of the kit. Top five things I'm doing on every mix here. Let's do a quick review. Number one is putting in my mix bus processing. So that's the console shaper, the bus compressor, and the tape machine, giving me a little bit more balance on my mix and a little bit more advantage right from the get-go, because I have these tones in, they're things I can push into as I pull faders up. Number two is the FET style compressor or the 1176 style compressor on my vocal. It helps keep my vocal competitive from the start when I pull it up. I can pull up the vocal, put this compressor on it, it's gonna be even, it's gonna be competitive from the get-go pulling it up. It's not gonna get hidden, it's not gonna be fighting the mix. It's gonna be there, it's gonna have an edge to it, which is nice. Number three is separating my bass DI and my bass amp frequencies. So using the bass DI as the low end and using the bass amp as the top end. This makes sure there is one signal putting out the low end. There's not two signals duplicating the same low end fighting for power there. We have one signal that's putting out our low end, keeps it powerful, keeps it consistent. Number three thing, or I'm sorry, number four thing I do every mix is putting in my plate reverb on my lead vocal. Again, remember about a two second plate reverb with the 152 millisecond pre-delay helps keep the reverb out of the way of the vocal but still giving the, it the length and the width it needs. And the final thing we're doing here on every mix is putting in the Bercasti reverb on my drums. So sending my kick, snare, two toms and overheads into this Bercasti reverb 
to get a little bit of extra room emulation from it. So it's a room emulation reverb and I pull it up underneath my drums, give them a little bit more realism, a little bit more bigness and to help them sit inside of the rest of the mix. I hope that was helpful for you now if you are ready to take your mixes to the next level and start dialing in your mixing workflow, then I have just the tool for you and it is completely free. It is my seven step mixing checklist. You can download it below using the link in the description and start creating more professional mixes in less time. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.